And so the fact that people were messaging me, inquiring about access, handing over credit card information on just a not really well-known trusted platform via Facebook. And my boss was asking me, what are you doing? How are you getting all these people to join? And I was like, I'm just documenting it on LinkedIn. And that was just when he told me, you've tapped into something and you've got something that you're, you've harnessed very, very early on and you need to ride this wave. So because of that, I leaped into uh, owning my, my social media agency. And I actually started the first female founded social media agency in Houston back in 2014. So we just celebrated our eight year anniversary. And then to kill the curiosity, my name is Karen, but I am not that Karen. So mm -hmm. I don't want to speak to the manager. I'm not privileged. I'm Latina. I mean, just not that Karen. So, all right. That was just a little background about me um, to get us acquainted with one another. As far as my presentation is concerned, what I'm going to be speaking about is the four pillars of social media. So the four pillars of social media are content, engagement, ads, and influence. And I'm going to dive into each particular pillar and describe and, and go into it a little deep. Please, please, please write down all your questions, save them to the end, and I'll open it up um, for Q&A. So content, let's start here. We've heard a lot of great content topics. There's been a lot of great information that's already be sh been shared today. And I'm really looking forward to the follow-up masterclass to this which is about video content specifically. But content in general, like what it is in the social media space is a combination of visuals, whether it be a static image or a video, and the copy, the caption copy, right, combined. Now that's what content means in social media. Now, platforms where your social media content will travel well or live well, it, can be platforms like Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, Snapchat, Twitter, YouTube, and others. There are other sub platforms too that are um, not mentioned here, like Pinterest or Reddit, also great platforms for content live. And the types of content that you can put out are organic, real time content, staged, produced content, UGC, which we've heard a lot about, user-generated content, employee-generated content, which is the new content that uh, is driving company culture and corporate culture a lot because that is the type of content that your employees are posting on their social media channels. And then obviously video and um, micro video and long format video. Now, there are some types of preferred content that that social media supports and supports very well. Just to kind of echo what our last um, session was speaking about, user-generated content, UGC as we know it, is the most valuable type of content because that is how a consumer is consuming your brand, product, or service. It is how they're consuming it and that's how the world is visualizing it. They're, that content is priceless and you can't, you know, um, you can't put a price tag on that. It's the most valuable type of content. But content itself, in general, is, is the big picture of it is all about, you know, telling a story, right? And in this conference, I've been teaching, I've been teaching this masterclass for quite some time now, and I like to educate people that content is all about, like, seizing the moment, doing some strategic campaign planning, it's about um, campaigning your content, but content is all around us. That's why I recorded you guys on my way in, because so much of content is really about documenting as it's happening. And when I top, when I tap into my content journey early on, the only thing that I was doing was documenting that, and people were consuming it. And so the secret to content is really telling, not selling. And I'm going to backtrack a little bit here because you want to be strategic about the way that you plan your content. You want to be more than just, you know, documenting or playing it out every day. You really want to hone into your story, define who you are, make a content plan, write a content strategy, and then document accordingly. 
So in order to get there, you want to really map this out. And when clients come to our agency and say, okay, we're going to start, you know, letting you guys do our content, we perform what's called an intake. And this is a sample of an intake that we would perform with a would-be client that's going to allow us to start to map out their content journey and figure out what we call content tabs or content buckets that we can draw um, content from. So if you take a look at the screen, and you're more than welcome to take a picture of it, as you're building your content strategy for social media, you want to identify your demographic, right? Your target audience, where they live, where they're at. And the reason for that is because a lot of um, marketers maybe think that they need to be spread out widely throughout all platforms. And the reality is you really only need to be in the platform where your audience is mostly active. That would be the key to being most successful in your content is to figuring out your demographic, who your target audience is, where they're active. And that could be TikTok, that could be Snapchat, that could be still Facebook. If you're a millennial or a mom or someone that's 40 and up, you know? So a lot of, a lot of your content strategy should come from where you're placing that content, okay? Where it's going to live. Now, you also want to look at some upcoming campaigns. What do you have going on in your world? You know, what do you want to create awareness for? Are you running perhaps a, a, let's see what these little cards are. No, I don't want to mess with those. Let's say that you're running a company that's selling bottled water, but every year you give back to global conservation efforts and you have a huge Earth Day campaign. Or maybe you're a big um, supporter of veterans and every day you do big campaigns surrounding Veterans Day and Memorial Day. And those are things that you want to create great awareness for. So once you identify that, you're able to strategically approach your content because now it'll be campaign driven. And that's what you want to create awareness for instead of just every day twisting and turning with, oh my God, Labor Day's coming up. It's summer. Now it's fall. I mean, all my content team is right now planning for fall because content is always mapped out, you know, months in advance. So think about that when you're mapping out your content strategy. Also, people wanna to connect to real brands that are doing real things in their community. So list out some community incentives that you have going on. Maybe you're doing a blood drive. Maybe you're doing a, food, a, a clothing drive. Maybe you're doing a um, charity gala. Talk about what your local community involvement looks like because, and you wanna document that because Users on the other side of the screen want to be connected to brands that are heavily involved in their communities. And then look at your seasonal trends in your business. You know, what's happening in the bottled water world? Maybe there are um, times of the year where people consume water the most. Maybe it's resolution forward. Maybe that's January where people are consuming most water because they set out to, to do that as part of a new year's resolution. So look at the seasonal trends in your business and then also look at like some promotional sales and offers that you're gonna wanna offer. With that, that's gonna be where you kind of start to extract your content buckets and figure out where you're going to be content wise. Well, I've got this campaign coming up. I know I have this local community involvement happening. I know I've got um, this promotional sale that I wanna push out and that's gonna kind of help you to map out your content strategy, right? And then identify your brand tone. So one of the things that I always ask incoming clients are, give me three keywords that define your brand. And really ask yourself that right now and write them down because if you're telling me right now that you're funny, you know, enthusiastic and engaging, then that's going to kind of build your tone and that's how you should be writing your captions. So now you've got a tone a brand tone to help you go along with this. Now, you know, I want to encourage you guys to be intentional with your content. And this is a great way to be intentional with it because you're going to be able to fight content fatigue. And content fatigue is a combination of just like every day twisting and turning like, oh, yesterday was national, you know, um, Margarita Day and tomorrow is this day. And you don't want to 
the way that content is so fast paced, you don't want to be moving like that every single day. So mapping out a content strategy helps you stay on brand and, um, you know, strategic and, and helps you fight that content fatigue that a lot of creators constantly fight. So again, I want to remind you that the secret to content is telling, not selling. So even while we're talking about, you know, these seasonal trends in your business or maybe some promotional offers, you never want to push it on your, on your end user. You never want to push it on your social media audience. You always want to tell your story in a way that is compelling and engaging enough for them to say, I want to get behind that brand because that brand is speaking to me. All right. So one thing to remember about social media and content too, is that, you know, the rules are still being written every day. Social media evolves all the time. And so there are a lot of ways to just continuously improve upon your content. So don't beat yourself up just for trying. Now, moving over to engagement, we talked about those, those four pillars of content, content, engagement, ads, and influence. I'm going to touch on all of them, but engagement is a very, 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 how would you say, ignored piece of the puzzle. Okay. And the reason why is because marketers heavily focus on content. They put it all in on the content side and they say, all right, I'm going to go all in on content. And they forget that engagement is actually how you manage the engagement that's coming in from the content you're putting out. So if you think posting the most amazing content video series uh, of a, a content campaign that you just rolled out is going to do it for you, it's not. You have to follow it up with engagement. Content builds traction. Engagement is how you manage traction, okay? So engagement is the act of replying to a comment, replying to a DM, prompting your users with a call to action, prompting them to tag, interact with your post. It is responding to your reviews. It is saving, it's prompting people to save your post. It's engaging with your audience. You know, when we were limited to Facebook and LinkedIn, we couldn't um, message from a brand side. We couldn't message with outbound users, but Instagram and Twitter affords us that opportunity every day for us, a brand like me, maybe some of you are on the brand side or um, on the agency side representing clients, you're allowed to engage with a whole new audience via hashtags, via location searches, and all these other uh, identifiers to find your audience and reach out so you can also do outbound engagement. So I have a little highway here because engagement is a two-way street. Engagement is inbound and engagement is also outbound. Inbound is what's coming in. Inbound is a comment that's coming in, a like that's coming in. Maybe somebody mentions you on, on your story. That's inbound. You want to manage that by doing some outbound engagement. So that's us on the brand side. How do we manage that? With, by engaging with our audience. I could walk into Central Market right now and pick, a, pick up a kombucha bottle and say, oh my God, I just found my favorite kombucha at Central Market or Whole Foods. And I could tag them on Instagram. You know who's going to repost me first? Whole Foods. I could order pizza from Pizza Hut and tag Pizza Hut on my story. And I've been reposted by Pizza Hut three seconds later because they have people that are dedicated 24 hours a day to reposting these stories and engaging with their audiences. That is the most important part about social media engagement. And so a lot of brands go through the, the exercise of creating amazing content, but don't follow through with the engagement. So you can see how heavily invested these big brands are that I've actually engaged with many times. And I, it's always such a pleasure, like knowing that someone on their team, on their end is on the other side, like looking at little me, you know, wanting to just tag my kombucha brand. And, and I get excited about that because I love when brands are this passionate about, you know, having an engagement force on their team. Now, 
some of you might be saying, well, the content that I'm posting, what if it's not triggering that much engagement? What if I'm responding to all my two comments and that's all I get a day, but I'm not getting any more engagement out of that. Take the time to find a new audience to engage with. Spend five minutes, 30 minutes a day finding an audience that you want to connect with. That's a good friend, good fit for your brand. But you can also promote and create new engagement by hosting a challenge, a contest, a giveaway. And that's going to promote engagement overall because it's going to be broadcasted. On, on a very much larger scale now that you've got um, a, a contest or a giveaway happening, okay? So that's how you can actually prompt engagement. And actually a colleague of mine, Mr. David Ramirez, who's in the audience today is gonna be speaking tomorrow. And he works for one of the biggest engagement aggregate agencies in social media, period. And he's gonna be speaking on that. So I encourage you to, come back and, and, and sit in for his session tomorrow because there's a lot to be learned about brands that are doing these types of engagement drivers, right? And um, that's how you can actually prompt engagement. You're going beyond the content that you post. So always leverage engagement to enhance your consumer experience, to enhance the consumer relationship. This is a great opportunity for you to not only repost the mention of someone using your brand product or service, but also thank them. Also encourage like to continue, keep, keep the conversation going. And um, you can also put on your social media bios, handles, when you prompt, uh, when you want to prompt other users to interact with your brand, give them a call to action. Say, hey, use this tag if you want to be reposted. And now people know. And they're encouraged, like, okay, I might have a shot at getting reposted by Pepsi. So I'm going to post my content drinking Pepsi because I want to be featured on their pages. Now, um, other ways that you can actually grow engagement are by hosting live events, live shopping events, live stream. We saw a lot of that happening uh, in, in, the, in the pandemic. It was happening before, but now it's just a way of life on social media, you know, so live stream events are also a great way to start to generate engagement. And I'm seeing a lot too of these live shopping events that are being hosted by the creator community, cross hosted with a brand. And so those are also kind of the home shopping network of our time. Like we're still early to this, this is still evolving. So if you have a product or service that's readily available online that you want to create awareness for, co-host an event with somebody really big in your industry. That would be a good partner for that. The key takeaway about engagement, what I want you to just understand, like I told you about content, the secret is telling, not selling. The secret to engagement is that your social media audience is your digital network. This is your social media network. So you're only as good as your audience, right? And so you want to just continue to engage with them. All right. So let me backtrack here just so I can get you guys to follow along. We talked about content. We talked about engagement. Make sure you write all your questions down. And now I'm going to hop over to paid ads. I spent a little bit of time on the influencer side. So kind of went through content, went through engagement um, pretty pretty quickly, but I want you to make sure you write down all your questions so I can answer them at the end. All right. Now, when it comes to paid ads, I told you content is how you build traction. Engagement is how you manage traction, but ads are how you pay for traction. So now we're paying, we're buying, we're like, all right, I'm doing great at content, doing my best with engagement, but you know what? I really need some things to convert on social. I need to see higher yields. I need to see higher results. I need to see higher engagement. Well, you're in luck. All social media is a pay to play platform. They're all open to pay to play because advertisers like us are what keeps social media platforms alive and thriving. Okay. So brands can rely on ads and have relied on ads for years to kind of further 
um, get their message out. And so ads are tried and true method to generating conversions, engagement, awareness, leads, etc. However, since probably out of uh, 2022, there's been a surge in rising cost of ads and marketers are now kind of scrambling to reshuffle their ad budget and figure out how do we want to allocate the ad dollars that we used to spend before. And a lot of those ad dollars are being reallocated to the influencer world. And I'll get to that on my next slide. However, ads are still the tried and true method for paid advertising and generating these conversions. And there is a strategic way to do ads and see if they're working. Because what I don't want to hear again is a marketer that says, well, I spent $10,000 a month on Instagram and it does nothing for me. Hold on though. Did you start with a test budget? Did you set a measurable conversion that you could see exactly what it was costing you, what it was doing? You can't gauge what you don't measure. And so a lot of brands and marketers throw budgets blindly at, you know, marketing dollars or paid ad dollars without actually having the intention. So just like content, we got to be strategic about ads too. So I encourage you that if you're running an ad campaign to kind of set a budget, consider your desirable conversion, you know, maybe install a pixel. There's still ways, even though privacy laws have changed the way that we've done ads for years, there's still a way for you to install a user um, pixel and collect cookie data from anyone that visits your website and use that data to retarget them on an ad. It used to be crazy um, when I would go to like the Nike website and I would look at a shoe and I would just hop off and then five minutes later I'd get on my phone and you know, Nike was like, hey, you left this in your cart. And it was like the exact same shoe and the exact same size. And I was like, oh my God, you know? And the thing is like cookies are still that effective and they can still work that way. If you disclose your audience on your website, what you intend to do with that data, and you get user permission, right? But um, you know, there's still great ways to get get really good results from a paid ad campaign. So you can also uh, create a behavior-based audience or a look-alike audience. If you have a mailing list, there's a workaround that uh, marketers have found when you're not getting users to opt into your cookie data or giving they're giving you permission to use their data to repurpose them with an ad, to retarget them with an ad. What you can do now is just do a contest or a giveaway and collect that data by doing so and then using that to create a lookalike audience. And so what that's going to do is it's going to give me um, a lot of the data that I otherwise would have gotten from from my website, but now they don't want to give you permission. You can get all those permissions if you host, if you host a um, social media contest, digital contest, et cetera. And I know David's gonna talk about that tomorrow. So I'm excited for that session. Now, you've got all these, um, you've got your ad strategy kind of pinned down. You know what you're going after. You have your budget. You know what you wanna measure. Now you need to get creative with your content. Now, the same approach that I told you about content applies here. It's telling, not selling. So don't just run an ad for the BOGO deal or the discounted offer, anything that's text heavy. Go ahead and run an ad on the content that shows that you're telling, not selling. And, you know, set up a landing page to measure your ads as well. Um, a lot of time people just want to run ads to a particular page on a website and then that allows users to navigate and really get lost once they land there. No, set up a dedicated landing page for this website so you can get the ultimate conversion and get the user to do what you really want them to do. Now, um, definitely I encourage you to start with a small test budget for any ad campaign, whether you have $10,000 to a lot this month or not, Start with a fraction of that because you want to measure the success of your campaign and you want to allocate your budgets accordingly once you have those results from your test ad set. And then for your consideration, I want to remind you that every platform has advertising capabilities and some platforms 
do better than others in terms of pricing, in terms of, you know, who is the most expensive for ads. I can tell you LinkedIn ads are way more expensive than Facebook ads, but there's a reason. On LinkedIn, you can identify the title of the individual that you want to go after in the city and the industry. So it's a very, very different advertising dashboard that you get on that platform. However, the same rule applies. Consider where your audience is mostly active and don't think about just the obvious platforms. Instagram, Facebook are the default platforms, right? Biggest platforms um, that advertisers go on for social media ads, but that's where everyone defaults to, but there's still Pinterest, there's Reddit, there's Twitter, and those are kind of the underlying platforms, platforms of the world that have millions upon millions and millions of users every single day that big advertisers aren't really tapped into. So I encourage you to look on those platforms if you want to get the most out of your strategic ad campaign as well. All right. So this brings me to my last topic. We talked about content, talked about engagement, just talked about ads, and now we're here at Influence. So Influence, even though it has ancient history, right? There's Cindy Crawford for Revlon, and there's I'm learning about this new social media museum exhibit pop-up that's going to happen that dates Influence all the way back to ancient Greek times, and that's so exciting because I honestly I'm really passionate about social media, so this really um, piques my perks my interest, but Influence itself has been around for years. You know, it's a commercial. We used to call it TV and commercial and ads. And influence on social media just changed the game. Now, five years ago, your influencer, your blogger, the dynamic, the name, the theme, the person, the individual has evolved. Five years ago, your influencer was like an entitled blogger that went into a restaurant in New York City and wanted a, or in LA and wanted a $500 table comp because she was going to post about it on her social media channels. And the manager of the restaurant was like so annoyed, but he had to oblige because she was, she fit the mold of this influencer slash blogger. The influencer today is a little bit different. Now they're being sought after. Now the tables have turned. Now they've worked so hard to create this paradigm shift in the creator industry, and they've actually created a lot of demand for what we know now as the influencer of the world. So the creator industry, influencer industry, is rapidly, rapidly evolving. And what you need to know is that the demand for influence is actually driving up the cost in the creator space. Not so much that they want a $500 comp for a table, for a lunch at a restaurant in LA, New York. What they want is to be valued and to be recognized for their hard work and their effort and their creative. Sometimes an influencer campaign can create a campaign. It's called a UGC campaign, going back to that type of content, in the way that they see your product, in the way that they consume your product. And so that type of content is so rich that it can actually outperform any of the content that we strategically campaigned for back in slide one, okay? Because this content has a greater impact. It is now reaching people that weren't even on your radar. It is reaching people on their radar, on their channels. And because technology has come so far, there are developments happening daily in the social media world. I mean, Snapchat two weeks ago rolled out a way for, um, no, it was Facebook, rolled out a way for a creator to tie the brand into their video. So now they can co-post it together. And that's actually been the case on Instagram for quite some time, where if I do a campaign with Whole Foods, I can cross tag Whole, Whole Foods and tag the partnership there. And now they have access to my data. So they have access to how that post performed. They have access to my analytics. And that's stronger than what we knew before. Before it was the girl or whomever going to the restaurant saying, you're going to pay for my meal, I want to come. But you didn't even know if that didn't. What if all her followers were fake? 
And so the way that the technology has advanced allows us to kind of have a, a, a broader visibility into the actual impact and the data behind each post and behind each content piece that the influencer community is um, putting out there. So just to kind of get us, get the conversation started, I want to let you guys, you know, think about it this way. Before there was B2B, that's how businesses were doing business with businesses. Then there was B2C, businesses talking to consumers, right? The creator industry has started a new category. In general, it's called C2C, it's creator to consumer. And that's how big this thing is. So when a lot of brands ask me like, do you really think it works? It's not if I think it works or not. It's something that it just, it's a mandatory for this to be part of your social media marketing campaign starting right now if you haven't already, period. And there are many, many ways to start it, right? And I'm gonna touch on that, um, on, on what you can do and what it'll get you. Because at the very least, it'll get you user-generated content, which is priceless. I already said you can't put a price on that. But there are so many other things that you can actually get and extract out of working with the creator community. So like I mentioned, the influencers, they're taking the center stage, right? They're just demanding to be paid for their creative output. The mind, the creative, the ideas, that's something that if you had you could have a boardroom session of creatives and conceptualize um, how you want to roll out a campaign, but you can give your product to an influencer and they'll have a creative idea for it in 30 minutes or less, you know? And, and it might do more than what that boardroom would do, depending on who the creator is. We like to work with creatives that conceptualize all their strategy instead of, there, there are wide ranges, right? But there are some that are just gonna do the bare minimum and there are some that are going to go out and get and and make sure that you feel content because they want to work with you again. And so that's key for influencer campaigns and influencer strategy. When you're working with the creator community, the repetition is key for you and for them. That's why they're working and giving you all this creative output because they want to they want a second gig. They want a long term thing. But this is important for you because. If I'm all the time talking about Whole Foods and Pizza Hut and you know other brands that I get behind and 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 the clothing company, there like, people might say like Karen's all over the place. But if everyone knows that I go to Whole Foods every single week and I get the same kombucha every single week, that's leaving a mark in people's mind. And so that repetition is key. And so brands should want to set of a collaboration that's ongoing, that's more of a repeat type of collaboration versus a one-time influence campaign, a one-time post. That's no longer effective, if you will, right? Because people will forget it. And sometimes influencer community, especially some that I've experienced, can be very naive. And they're like, no, I've already worked with that brand. You want to work with that brand again because that's what's gonna make you as an influencer attractive to other brands. That's what creates the brand affinity. So if you're going about it, um, if you're going about your influencer campaigns, I guess I want to kind of just guide you, right? In terms of how the process works and how you should be approaching them, okay? So obviously this is the step-by-step -step process. Like, well, how does it work? Well, the influencer is gonna receive your product or your experience, and then they're going to create a content piece promoting that product or experience. They're gonna upload it. Now that content is gonna reach their followers and it's gonna create the awareness. And then the, the, the awareness can turn into sales and has impact for your brand. You always wanna make sure that you have yourself set up to measure the success of every influencer campaign that you do. So make sure that you've got the, um, the tags in place so that you can look at the analytics or that you set yourself up with a CRM that measure the analytics of a campaign. 
we recently partnered with um, a company that does analytics and CRMs for influencers only. So every time that we sell an influencer package, we're able to collect the data as a whole and present it to our client and say, this is the deliverables. This is what we got out of it. This is the, not only the user generated content that we saw from the campaign, but also the analytics behind it, the reach, the new followers, the hashtag uses, et cetera. So there's influencer CRMs out there that will package this for you. Now, where you want to be most careful is how you approach these influence, these influencers, okay? Because they require a delicate approach. What you don't want to do is you don't want to get blacklisted by the influencer community because there's a lot of that too in our industry. And, you know, you want to just, when you're working with an influencer, make sure that you have your campaign deliverables, that you don't just say, hey, I want to send you a product and see if you like it. So there's no call to action. There's no deliverable. There's no contract. There's no timeline. And so if you don't have those parameters in place, you can find yourself sending out a thousand units of product and getting zero silge nada in return for three months because there's no urgency. There's no compensation. There was nothing discussed other than I'm going to get a free product and I might do a story for it. But you didn't tell me if I had to do anything. You know, you didn't offer me an affiliate code. Want to have all those parameters laid out so when they receive your product, they now know exactly what to do with it, what the timeline is. But you want to make sure that you have a delicate approach. And don't approach all the influencers as if they're just going to be working with you for free, per se. A good way to start a conversation with a member of the influencer community is by saying, hey, we're looking for influencers that want to collaborate with our brand. Are you open to collaborations? And do you have a rate card? Go ahead and ask that off the bat because you want to make sure that if they have a rate card, you won't even have to go as far as discussing terms and compensation and rates because they're already going to come with that. So you can get an idea of what they're charging per post, right? And you'll find that most of the time, influencers that have a good brand synchronicity with your brand, product or service, they're going to, if they're in alignment there, they're going to want to work with you. So just because they send a rate card doesn't mean that you can't create like a custom package, you know? Um, so take the conversation a step further, go in and discuss all the parameters, what you're trying to get from them, what you're trying to push out, what the timeline campaign deliverables are. And that's how you'll be able to work through any of the potential kinks that sometimes present themselves when brands just expose themselves sending free products and then they don't get what they were hoping for in return. But what you can count on in return from working with the influencer community is all or some of these things. You're gonna get customer acquisition. You're going to get user-generated content. You're going to get engagement. You're going to get a broader reach. You're going to get product awareness. You know, people are discovering products every single day. Raise your hand if you've ever bought a product just because you saw an ad on social media. Okay, I'm glad I wasn't the only one because this is kind of like what I teach for a living. So, um, yeah, you know, that goes to show how often we are discovering products just on this channel. So this creates product awareness. It also gives you testimonials and real testimonials at that, you know, and you can be discreet with them and say, hey, look, we'd love for you to share your experience. If you, if there was anything that you didn't like about the brand, maybe tell us offline. We want to hear your full, you know, story. Um, approach that very delicately as well. But you want to make sure that you hear them because from a testimonial perspective, they're going to be very honest with you as well. So that gives you just true representation, right? In the social media world without having to do like what we did the old school way hiring a guerrilla marketing team and a, a team of ambassadors, hiring a team of marketers on the ground, doing, you know, product samplings and tastings at Costco. This kind of eliminated that. Now consumer packaged good brands, liquor brands, wine brands, clothing brands, fashion brands, even financial services can get the power to leverage, you know, partnerships with influencers and get all of this 
and those measurable conversions as well. So, you know, I would just encourage you um, to approach your influencers delicately, but create a fluid, cohesive strategy so that it's foolproof. It answers all their questions up front and they know what their deliverables are and they know what they have to turn turn into you. So with that being said, um, I'm going to open it up for questions and I hope you have a lot of questions for me while you guys are thinking about your questions. I'm going to leave you with some hacks that might help you. I teach an Instagram hacks class every month in Houston at our home office. And this is something that I always teach people. So while you're coming up with your questions, I want to invite you to opt into some of these Instagram hacks. Um, make sure that your camera setting on your iPhone is always recording video at 4K. All my social media content is always crispy. And when you see creators like, man, what kind of camera do they use? Every, they put out the crispiest type of um, video. Make sure that you have your video setting to record on 4K at 60 frames per second. That's 60 FPS. And then on your Instagram and in your settings and your um Account settings, make sure that you turn on your high quality uploads on your Instagram. Because even if you're driving around and you're on 5G or maybe you want to go live, you can prevent having like a fuzzy static signal um, because you have a high quality upload setting where it's going to use up a little bit more battery juice on your phone, but it's going to upload um, to your Instagram in the clearest picture possible. And then um, I would encourage if you're working, if, if you're on the marketing side, on the brand side or the agency side to start a support engagement pod. The engagement pod is something I didn't touch on in the, in the engagement section, but it's a tried and true method to support one another. So if, for example, you're working at a company and you're the CMO, you want to start a group with all of your marketing colleagues and your marketing team to support content that's being published to your page as it goes live. And so that way you all can contribute to the engagement just within the organization and do it sporadically so that it doesn't look like you guys do it every day. Um, but definitely starting a support pod is a great engagement driver. And then also um, if you're having trouble staging content, shooting content, I would just encourage you to always have a tripod and a Bluetooth shooter with you. Um, I always travel with one in my car and I have my Bluetooth shooter. So people think like, man, you're going to all these crazy places. Like who's recording this content or who's shooting your content? And it's just me. I'm doing it with my tripod and my Bluetooth shooter. So I uh, invite you to follow me along here. Connect with me on LinkedIn and on TikTok. Trying to be a little bit more proactive on that platform. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing your content strategies. Hope I can connect with you on social media and I'll follow you back. And I hope you found this presentation very useful. I'm open for questions if you guys have any. Right there. Hold on, wait for your uh, the microphone box. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so excellent presentation about influencers and engagement. Have you thought about differences between web two and web three for influencers? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think it's time that we all start to brainstorm like our digital twin and, um, and, and what that looks like. I attended an event recently that was hosted by Forbes and it was actually in a metaverse like environment where you had to have an avatar design to attend the event. And when you're in it, it was just like in, in, a, in, in a metaverse world. So definitely. And I think that Right now, you're still early to that. It's a very, very, very good question. If you're starting to map out your digital twin and your web three journey, involve influencers and make them a part of that. Definitely create a strategy for that part as, as we start to evolve. And I think that that's going to take shape very rapidly over the next really 12 to 24 months for sure, where we start seeing that's just, you know, we're in it. It's here now. We can still be early to it, but very proactive way of thinking. All right, anybody else? Come on, there's gonna be some more questions from people. Don't let her off easy, here we go. I can see that these speakers have been nerfified, so if people don't ask questions, I'm just gonna start throwing these nerf boxes around, and if I hit you, you have to ask oh, a question. Perfect. 
No. That's, Nobody's no. biting on that one? No. <laughs> All right, we'll do it the old-fashioned way. Fine. Okay, okay. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, hi, Karen. That was great. I have a quick uh, question regarding Instagram posts and like getting more engagement on Instagram. Do you notice that if you're posting stories consistently that you'll get more engagement on your grid posts? Absolutely. So Instagram wants you to post. Um, you, you should be posting at least two to three stories daily. That's going to drive up your engagement. It's a known thing. And also all of the tools that Instagram provides you with on the story buttons, whether it's a Jiffy sticker, whether it's a web link or call to action, they have the, the seasonal stickers. Like for um, June, we just finished where they had all the LGBTQ um, stickers that people could use for Women's History Month. They had um, stickers. Use those because those will actually prompt your engagement. So any tool that Instagram rolls out, you want to make sure that you tap into that because that's a way where they're saying you, here you go, it's free play on our platform. You know, you can actually use these tools and, and leverage them to gain more engagement. All right. Before I wrap it up and open it up for our next speaker. Well, no, I won't be doing that. I don't Any want to take your job. Any questions, anybody? Rob. Anyone? <laughs> No, okay. we're going we're to let her off easy, everybody. we got 10 minutes, technically more on the clock. If you guys have any more you want to dig into, any personal challenges at your companies that you would like an impromptu opinion on? Yeah, are there any campaigns? I've been asked this a lot, you know, like, um, can I go viral in 2022? And if you ask me, can I go viral in 2020 on TikTok? Yes, everybody went viral on TikTok in 2020. That was like, that was a thing. But in 2022, you can still go viral. You can still get hundreds of thousands followers in six months or less. I mean, if you work a strategy like this, there, there, there's a way. If you have a method, there's a way. Yes. Oh, there we go. Great. Mike's right behind you. Okay. I earned my pass now. Okay. The second question, um, when you do the Instagram stories versus, you know, kind of video posting um, versus regular posting, what is the usual breakdown that you're seeing for successful Instagram accounts, you know, video versus just, you know, static postings? And then what's kind of like how many of static ones, like photographs would you do versus the video? Gotcha. Really, really good question. So um, I'm going to take your question and break it up into two parts. So Instagram stories per se, I think see up to 10% of your audience on a good day. If you see 10% of your audience on stories, that's a really, really good day for you. Okay. But Instagram feed posts see three to 5% of your audience. And that's whether that's video or static images. Now reels, totally different animal. Those the reels, depending on the content and the shareability, that's what drives the visibility and the engagement on the reel. So it's about how many people are sharing it within five to 15 minutes of it first being posted is what determines if your reel is going to go viral or not. And a reel can see exponentially over the amount of your audience because the real algor algorithm is set up to be very favorable for you depending on the nature of the content and the shareability. How shareable is it? There's one last question over here. Awesome. Hi. Um, we work for a live entertainment industry district in Los Angeles. Awesome. And I wanted to know if you had any tips or tricks for using music, music in ads or even just you know, our own creative content and how to get around some of the licensing issues. Absolutely. Okay. So this is, this is a little workaround that we use. Um, obviously I don't know how much you guys know about using commercial music on a business page, but Instagram itself does not default you to use commercial music without a commercial music license. However, there's a workaround that you can actually find the song. Let's say that you're promoting a particular artist and you, they, their song already lives in the music catalog because obviously it's been properly licensed and registered. The workaround that we use, I don't know if I want to suggest this, but as you find their song, I'm not suggesting it, I'm just telling you, 
how you would do it if you wanted to do it. Um, if you find their song on Instagram and then where you go to save audio, there's a little button at the bottom where you go to use audio and you can actually just load your uh, video over that audio. Now, if you do it like in a video editor, external video editor, apply your audio to it and upload to Instagram like that with the right audio uh, without that workaround, Instagram will actually, even though you don't have a commercial music license and you weren't able to see that on your catalog, you can actually, it will, it will automatically attach the name of that artist to the song and give that person credit because that's the only reason why they they want to do it. They want you to have a commercial license. I hope that they find a workaround um, for that, honestly, because let's say here in this room, while we're in between break sessions, we've got the music that's playing. And that's because this hotel has obviously, you know, paid into the commercial music license. And I hope that they let brands kind of pay into that as a subscription service as well, because I think brands really miss out by not being able to utilize that music. But those are two workarounds, so you're totally welcome to upload to it. It'll just automatically embed the song um, on its own because the, the, the bot will figure out what song it is, and it'll attach the audio to that. Mm -hmm. We have one more question over here. So recently, Instagram has been lowering reach from pictures so they could compete with TikTok's algorithm in the age of, you know, video, short video content. How would you recommend for brands to um, have a call to action to their pictures? Because sometimes, yes, the video is good, but sometimes the information from the pictures or from the content that needs to be on the feed is as good. So how would you recommend right. people go about that? Yeah, I think a workaround that some, you know, brands are using are obviously hiding like counts. You know, if they want the optics of it, you can't hide like counts from reels. But I think that that's kind of, it, it's, it's very obvious, right? That when a brand is posting a static image versus a reel, the reach is exponentially different. Um, but the workaround to that would be kind of like I said, just a few minutes ago to close out, is starting a pod, starting a community of people that are going to engage with your content in your organization. So as soon as you drop a post, letting people um, know, hey, I've got, we've got a new feed post that's live. We need engagement. And I know that the creator industry does this as well, especially when it's like a paid collaboration. They're really looking for their community to support them. And so that would be uh, two workarounds. So maybe I would suggest like either, you know, building a unique engagement pod within your organization and just getting everybody to support one another, support, you know, the content that's coming out on the feeds um, and then hiding your like count if the optics really, really matter to you. Because some people are like married to those optics. For me, I go back and forth. Like I just posted a feed post and I know that it's not going to have that same reach, but you know, um, that's just the nature of the beast. And, and again, the content that will have significant posts of static images on feeds will get into the Explorer page and will get visibility because of its shareability. So make sure that the content is shareable. Like use that as your call to action, share. Okay. All right, anybody uh, else? So we have time for another one. I, yeah, all the way over there. Awesome. Uh, first off, amazing presentation. Thank you so much, Karen. Thank you, David. Um, so can you talk through your process about onboarding a new um, like influencer, creator? Like, How do you check to make sure not just that their content is good, but that they're not problematic or that they're not like, shall we just say crazy? I know it's not right. easy, but how right. do you make sure they're kosher? <laughs> right. And I actually, as a Digimarcon in Brooklyn, my first conference to speak at this year, I met a company that's an insurance agency for influencers because they now have to, they're encouraged to carry um, an E&O policy just like any business because they could uh, create a landslide of, of um, you know, bad press or maybe be bad representation for a brand. And so they could get, um, sued and now there's a whole new insurance category right for for the creator community 
Um, we use different benchmarks to kind of check off if the influencer is using bots or if they're using an authentic audience. And there's also a plethora of websites that are paid. It is a pay to play platform where you can actually verify and just enter any creator, public profile or business profile into a search tool and check their social grade. And you can search if they're an A, B, C, just about, you know, a lot of users just in general, if you're using like big conversation today is on Twitter and it's about Elon Musk not wanting to buy it because of the bots, the nature of the beast is that there are bots in every platform, period. And some bots latch onto people that are trending, growing, following. They like literally hop on to follow you. So avoiding an inauthentic audience is sometimes at the hands of the user by just checking every follower, removing them. And it's a very tedious job, but I know I kind of fall victim to that. Sometimes when I see somebody following me and I'm like, oh, retired Marine has 10,000 followers and has all the pictures posted in one day. It's a dead giveaway to see who's fake and who's not, right? So you can always remove that follower. You as a brand have the ability to remove a follower. And I think a lot of people don't know that. So you just, if you see something that looks sus, you can just remove that follower. As far as vetting creators for who we want to work with, we just do what's called a social audit and just gauge their engagement, look at their comments, and then run a social grade on them and figure out what the, what the, Computer is telling us about their following and their their reach. Well, great. Thank you, Karen. How about a round of applause for Karen, everybody?